uh, welcome to the uh, Grow Engineer Small Business Summit. Uh, this is the first in a series of events. And this is uh, a very exciting day for all of us at Go Engineer. And we are glad you are here. Um, Small Business Growth Summit. Today's session is being prepared for success. Our presenters and panelists are Chad Harlow, who is um, um, an owner of the Chad Harlow Law Firm, Shivani Patel from Houston. She is an office manager and she will be um, uh, answering questions. For those of you who have questions, please use the Q&A button. All of your microphones are, are muted uh, for the recording. And uh, if you have questions, please submit it through the Q&A button down at the bottom of your screen. Along with Shivani as one of our panelists is Stephen Darcy. He's a, an elite application engineer and one of the best engineers we've got. Uh, uh, and he will also be answering questions. And then we have Nash Allen, uh, your account representative. And then you have myself. Um, this is something completely new for everyone here at Go Engineer. But this is something very meaningful to everyone here at Go Engineer. You're here for a reason. You may not know why, or maybe you do, but we're glad you're here. We know that small business is the backbone of America. And in these crazy times, it might seem like the backbone is bending a little bit. But we will emerge from this. We will be stronger and we will be ready for success. I firmly believe that those that are preparing right now will see the greatest success when we recover. And that's what today's session is all about, being prepared for success. Our mission. We want your company to be what you want it to be. What do you want your company to be? Do you want to be a business with 100 employees, 300 employees, a global power, a, just a manufacturing company, a service provider, or even a sole provider? Whatever it is, we want you to be successful. We want you to achieve your goals, and we're investing in you. Who are we? This is Go Engineer, or some of our employees. We are 300 plus strong. Um, we're an industry leader. We have trusted partners. And we have 25 offices across 14 states. Who we serve. One of the biggest things that I want to bring attention to is this one right here. Two thirds of our end customers employ 50 people or less, and one quarter of our organizations employ less than five, five. Again, we want you to be successful. We understand small business because that's how we started. And we wanna help you be exactly what you wanna be. Joining me today is Chad Harlow, or joining us today rather, is Chad Harlow, a business attorney, a certified uh, Fix This Next coach, and a good friend. Uh, Chad's son uh, and my daughter, uh, Emmeline, uh, Chad's son, Bill, uh, they go to the same school together. They've been to kindergarten and they've been to first grade. Uh, and that's how Chad and I met. And we live in the same neighborhood. And, and Chad, we're so glad you're here today. Chad, are you there by chance? All right, cool. Chad, tell us a little bit about yourself and tell us a little bit about uh, Fix This Next and, and all that. Okay. <clears throat> so, yeah, uh, Chad Harlow, I'm the owner of, uh, of the law firm, and you think of us as a outsourced general counsel. Uh, our primary focus is business owners, and uh, most of my clients are small, small business owners, um, some medium-sized business owners, but we are more of the outsourced general counsel. So uh, I'm their legal department that they don't have on staff. Uh, they, they call me when they need me um, and I help them uh, with all kinds of legal matters. 
Um, I'm also uh, the co-founder of another company called Profit Builders Group. Um, I'm a certified Pistis Next coach, or actually it's a uh, advisor. Uh, we don't like using the word coach. Business coach sounds kind of funny for a lot of people. <laughs> but what we do at uh, Profit Builder Group is uh, we help business owners uh, make sure that their, their businesses run profitable, mm-hmm. uh, they run smoother, and uh, that, that the business actually achieves the goals that the business owner wants and uh, even the goals of the employees. Um, and that's what we do. Um, I guess I'm here today to talk more about the uh, hiring an independent contractor mm-hmm. or employee, mm-hmm. um, but I'm, I've got a lot of information, and if I can't uh, answer your question, I will find the right person for that. So please don't hesitate to reach out to, to me to, to ask any kind of question you might have. Cool, Chad. That's awesome, man. And, and, and again, uh, personally, thank you for being here. And uh, I know we've we've talked about the, doing this for a while, and uh, I, I'm glad you're here today, and, and I'm glad everybody here who is watching is here today too. Um, and again, we want to hear from you, so um, don't be afraid to to get into the Q and A session, and we get into SolidWorks. Myself, I'm David Kersley. I'm an application engineer uh, with Go Engineer here in Austin. I'm also a small business owner. I've been a small business owner since 2014, and uh, that is mainly focused on consulting and designing of golf equipment. And so I've been through uh, everything that we're gonna talk about today, especially when we talk, we get into the business side of it and talking about with Chad, like, hey, do I hire an employee? Or do I hire a contractor? What do I have to do to do that? Or do I not hire either one of them and try and man it by working 20 hours a day, right? And, and that might work, and I've tried it, right? And it works for a little bit, but eventually your family wants to see you and eventually, you know, it catches up to you, right? So this is different. This is not a um, a user group where, or our standard webinar where we're just gonna give you some solid works. This, this, this business summit, again, we're investing in you. Those of you that are attending and watching, we're investing in you. We want you to be successful so we have to hear from you, and we'll talk about that more later. But, man, we this is a great opportunity for us to, to get together, hear about, and grow not only on the SolidWorks side. Yes, we're going to have SolidWorks uh, as part of this. But this is about growing your business and understanding how to grow your business. We're going to have tax attorneys. Um, we have a, a representative from Dale Carney's. He's going to be joining us. We have business planners. We have um, internet and web developers that will be joining us in this series. So this is stage one. This is the first of it, and, I, and we're glad you're here. SolidWorks. So we're going to start with the SolidWorks preparation. And I want to start with a little story. When I first started my business, um, I was lucky enough to have a contract or two in place. And I was trying to grow my business. And I got a call about, hey, uh, would you be interested in designing some putters for us? And so I got on a plane and I went out to this putter company. And I had designed and uh, put a bunch of models together, had the presentation ready. And I thought I was going to go out there, show them the models. They were going to be wowed and it was going to be balloons popping and champagne and everything. And it was the exact opposite, right? Like I, I, they totally didn't care about the models I had. They looked at them for like, I don't know, maybe two or three minutes. We talked about it and they were like, we want to design this on the fly. And it was kind of a mess on my end. And personally, my anxiety went up and I was like not prepared. And I was trying to figure out how to do things on the fly. And I was having sketches that were overdefined and underdefined. And I was trying to figure out this command or that command. And I was like, man, I will never do this like this again. And so what I want to tell you is um, we're going to show you some, some, some things to prepare you for success. Now, we have to be honest with you. Just because you follow these steps, you're not going to get 100% of your contracts there's just no way to guarantee that. But what we have done is we have put together a bunch of tips and tricks just from the start so you that you're prepared for success. 
do the homework, just like this guy with the anvil. He's hammering out the hard work now so that when you're in front of the customer and you're doing that pre presentation and you're trying to win that design contract, you're ready to go, All right? Now, I walked out of that uh, meeting, got on my plane, and was like, never again, right? I will never go through that torture again. I'm going to figure out ways so that that doesn't happen again. And what I'm going to show you here is just a culmination of that. So, winning your presentation, tips and tricks. We're going to cover setting up your SolidWorks environment. I call it setting up your environment. We're going to talk about global variables and equations. We're going to talk about short but shortcut customization. We're going to talk about display states. And I'll be honest with you, and, and I'll probably mention it again here. Um, one thing I learned was um, I was doing some 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 designs for a, a local company, and um, they were like, "Hey, David, can you design this part for us?" And I designed this part for them, and I did my homework, right? I, I knew exactly what products they offered, the variations of the products that they offered, and so I put the work in up front. So I went in. And not only did I have that part, the base part in place, but I had display states. And I'll be honest with you, if you go into a presentation and you're trying to win a design contract and you've worked on this model and you have one variation, one configuration or one display state, and you're competing with me at against for this contract, you're at a disadvantage. So we wanna make sure that you're at an advantage because if I can show the customer, maybe they offer a product in 10 colors, right? If I have all these display states set up in their specific colors and I can show them their product, this new product in all their colors, they have a great idea of what this product's gonna look like and how they can market it, how they can sell it, and it's gonna give you a little bit of a wow factor. And then we're gonna do a little live demo. I'm gonna show you how we put everything, the setting up of your environment, the global variables, the short uh, shortcut bar customization, display states and I'm going to show you how I've set up some templates so that when I do a live demo like I did for this golf company that we can create this product quickly and efficiently and there it's impressive for them okay and then we're going to talk about you won the design that's awesome right so we did our tips and tricks we did our homework we did everything that we needed to do right we wowed them in the in the presentation uh, we agreed to a contract, and now what happens? And this has happened to me personally, right? Like I went to thinking I'm going to win a putter contract, right? And it was going to be one. But what I found out was they had five more programs that they awarded. So now we're at six programs. And, and this is where we want to differentiate this from your normal webinars or your user groups. This is where we're gonna focus on the business side of it. And that's where Chad's gonna, he has a great presentation. And so uh, it, it's it's gonna be very informative for you. And I've, I've learned a lot and I'm so appreciative Chad's here, but what do we do, right? Again, I don't really wanna work 20 hours a day. What do I do if I hire an employee, right? What do I do if I hire a contractor? How do I hire a contractor? What are the legal ramifications? What are the business ramifications? What are the tax ramifications? And we're going to talk about all that, or Chad is, and we're going to have some great conversations. And while Chad is presenting as well, we do want to have your questions come in. So let's get started. So let's talk about SolidWorks and let's get into SolidWorks. And we're going to talk about some of the things that we want to do to set us up for success. So anytime... You know, you, you come into SolidWorks and what I try to do is I try to make sure that I set up environments and templates and I want to make sure that I can get access to my files quickly. Now, you may have your files on the cloud, you may have them on a portable drive, or you may have them somewhere stored on your computer or however you're going to link to in this presentation. So you walk into the presentation and you have some files that you've prepared. 
one of the first things I do is over here on the right in the design library is I make sure that any file that I need to have quick access to I have now as an application engineer here at go engineer so blessed to have this job and so lucky right I I have access to these demos like so if someone wants to see a model or we need to demonstrate a module inside of SolidWorks I can quickly click on these and, and have access to show you the, the software Steve Darcy showed me this trick and it was awesome and I'm like oh this makes perfect sense and how do I get quick access to this so click on your design library here these little three little books and at the top of your screen you're gonna see those three books with a little star and it says if you hover your mouse over it like everything in SolidWorks will tell you what's going on so we're gonna hit add file location and this looks just like any other file you're looking for inside of SolidWorks right but we're gonna to go to my desktop and I'm gonna look for something called small business SBGS small business growth summit and I'm gonna hit OK and we'll notice over here on the right that folder even though it contains subfolders everything is correct and I have quick access to it so if I'm trying to access files I can open them quickly that's the first thing that I set up the other things in my environment so let's talk about let's do a new and when we do new most of us you, you have the novice view and that just gives you a part assembly or a drawing right and I do I usually leave mine on advanced and I've created templates and we're going to show you how to create these templates and these templates if I click on them you'll notice over here in my preview window you'll see that I have sketches that are already in these files and I've already set up my environment for success in a few minutes after we've gone through how to set up some of these tips and tricks we're gonna run through this putter creation and it's gonna take us a, probably about less than five minutes to do it right and that's gonna be pretty awesome so what I do is I save these templates out and they all have names but how do we create them right where where are these coming from so let's just say we open one of our training parts uh, a template part underscore inch and we say okay right and so when we open up SolidWorks again over here on the right my library is still linked I have quick access to the files that I want in front of my customer a couple settings that I like to make sure that I'm a, I have turned on for me is if I go to settings and I go to system options and when I click on sketch one of the things I like to click on is this one here and it's enable on-screen numeric input for creation entity so uh, I'm gonna show you that here in just a second but what it allows you to do is as you're sketching and as you're drawing things it allows you to automatically enter the value for let's say we're gonna do a rectangle and it's gonna allow me to enter the two values as opposed to drawing it ske or sketching it and then going back and hitting the smart dimension button then adding all the dimensions but we're gonna do this and something really cool happens when we use uh, global variables and global uh, uh, and equations we can create multiple parts by having this enabled and SolidWorks is going to kind of recognize some of the sketch features and help us create multiple parts um, also one thing I like to make sure that I have is I like to make sure that on my document side what is your overall drafting standard is it ANSI is it ISO and whatever it is find that and click on it I like to have all the uppercase notes uh, I usually keep these on, on uh, checked and then obviously as you go through this if I want to change the font and the font style I'll set that up as well that's a personal preference and then I'm just gonna hit OK here uh, the last one I'll do is I like to move the image quality and set these to the highest standard possible and then I'll hit OK and that while that can slow down the rendering it produces the smoothest cleanest edge part and it makes a, a nice part especially when you're in front of the customer then what I like to do is I like to, to set all my customizations in place so how do we get to customization and I want to make sure that again when we're working in SolidWorks what we don't want your mouse doing is going here to here because these are seconds right and when you're in front of a customer and you're trying to knock out a model and you're trying to win this contract this is time 
I'm wasting time moving my screen. So what I want to do is I want to set up customizations so that everyone's focus is on the model, not up here, right? So how do we do that? So right click kind of up in this gray space here and you can hit customize. There's a couple ways to get there. Now I'll tell you, I'm not as young as I used to be. I wish I was younger, but I'm not, right? I can't stop time. For those of you who want to see different icon size inside of your SolidWorks, this is where you would change that, okay? So maybe you get to a point where you, uh, you know, your eyes aren't as young as they used to be. If you click on, say, this middle one here, you'll notice that what happens is the icons up here have changed size, and they just changed that. So if I click on this one, this goes back to your normal uh, icon size, and now everything's back down to where this and uh, the default setting is right so again if you ever have issues with your eyes or you have a customer uh, maybe it needs to see something uh, in a larger format makes it easier for them to see uh, that's where you would do it let's talk about mouse gestures now when you're in your mouse gestures your left mouse button does a lot but there's also the right mouse button so if I take my right mouse button and I hold it down and I move my mouse around these little wheels will come up and wherever I move inside that wheel I can set these up now I'll be honest with you me personally I don't use this option very much okay but there are some of you out there that will like to use that mic uh, right mouse button and when you do you can customize these so I, we've got one for uh, part sketch drawing and assembly level right and if I want to add something to that all I have to do is let's let's add the close over here to the part level. So I'm just gonna click on it, drag on it, and hold down that left mouse button until I kind of hover it over this little square there, or that little uh, piece of the pie here. And guess what? Now close is available, so I can customize every one of these settings right here. Uh, and that's pretty cool, right? Uh, if I go to keyboard settings. You can print the list. SolidWorks comes with a ton of these pre-defaulted. So I'm going to click on shortcuts here, and this is going to put everything in a priority. And let's just go in um, reverse order here, starting at Z. So if I hit the Z key on my space, uh, my, uh, my, my keyboard here, I'm automatically in Zoom. Again, this is where you're going to want to set up and know what your shortcuts are. You can customize these, right? So the one I want to pay attention to is right here, shortcut bar. And it's the S key on your on your keyboard. Um, over the years, I've learned to rely on this guy more and more and more. And what I've started to do is realize with each project, I may use a different set of commands. So when I activate this shortcut bar, I'm going to hit OK here for just a second. If I'm in this and I just hit the S key, there's the shortcut bar. And you can see all of the customizations and the options that I have available to you. Now, some are grayed out, right? Like, I can't extrude cut anything. I can't fill it anything because there's nothing there yet, right? But I can go into sketch, and I can get over to boss extrude. I can create reference geometry, things like that, right? So how do we get back there? Again, right-click up here at the top, hit Customize, and let's get back over to our keyboard. And I'm going to set that up again to find that list. There it is. And you can print this, right? So this will come out as a list. And then you can sit there and figure out what you want your keyboard to be. Again, keep your eyes focused and your customer's eyes focused on the model, not you moving your mouse all around the screen, right? Lastly, we're going to go to the shortcut bar, that little guy that came up there. So you've got four of them that you can completely customize, okay? And this is my parts shortcut bar. Again, thus the part icon, right? We're used to seeing that. And this one, this is assembly, right? We see that every time we make an assembly, right? The little uh, yellow plus with a little uh, blue square here, right? Icon for that. And then we also have the drawing shortcut bar and we have a sketching tool bar, our bar, right? So for me, when I'm sketching, I have these things so that I can quickly access them. And I also have things like Boss Extrude, Extrude Boss Base, Revolve Boss Base, Cut. And how do I add something to it? Well, over here where it says Toolbar, maybe I want to add a feature, right? So if I scroll down here and I find Features, 
bam, there's my features. And these are all the icons that are up here at the top under features. And I think if I click on this, it's going to can't. Nope, there it is. So most of these are here. So I'm looking at it and I say, guess what? I want to add one of these linear patterns or I want to add wrap, right? If you hover your mouse over, it tells you exactly what it is. So let's add wrap. And all I do is I hold down the left mouse button. I drag and drop exactly where I want it in this group. And I drag and drop it. And guess what? Now when I access and I'm in the sketch command and I hit the S key, this little menu is going to come up and I've got access to wrap now. I don't have to go up to here, find it, or come up here to the top right and type in wrap, right? Now I got to go find that command. And you can find a command again by looking at the command on the right and there's wrap. I can go from there. So I customize every scenario, whether I'm in part modeling, assembly modeling, uh, drawing uh, shortcuts, whether I'm in drawing mode or I'm doing a sketch. And I set all of these up, right? And so now here's my environment. I've set up my environment uh, to show you that wrap. Uh, maybe I want to find the wrap command for those of you that haven't seen it up here on the top right. If you make sure that this little uh, there's a little black screen with a greater than symbol, little gator mouth here. If I type in wrap, um, this will find that command for us. Okay, and it'll point to where it is on your system, or you can find it and then just drag and drop up here as well. So let's say we're going to start a command and we're going to start a sketch, right? But I want to save my environment first. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to save this and we're going to save file, save as, and I'm not going to save this as a drawing. This thing's looking at it as a drawing. I'm going to save this as a template, uh, an, uh, a PRT dot DOT, I mean a PRT DOT. And that stands for a part template. And when I click on it, it's automatically going to take me to where SolidWorks, and I've actually stored mine in, a, in the SolidWorks uh, program data, SolidWorks, SolidWorks 2020 templates. And you can see the, here that I've created a whole bunch of these, right? And so if I've got one called SBGS, uh, Small Business Growth Summit Test, and let's say I'm going to name it test, and we're going to call this one dash one, right? Now I have this template, and I hit save. And if I close this file out, now I want to go, I'm sitting in front of my customer. I want to start my new program. When I hit new and I go to my templates and I scroll down, there is SBGS test dash one. And if I pick on them again, you can see over here on the right, I've got a preview of what's in there. Some of them may or may not have sketches. This one, we didn't, we didn't hide in a sketch, right? So let's just open this one up. And everything that we've already saved is available to us now, right? One of the other key things that I like to do now that I have my environment set up, one of the big ones is I like to set up uh, and manage uh, equations and global variables. This is going to make your life so much easier once you get used to using these. To access it, right click on this equations folder and if you don't have access and you don't see this equations folder right click in this little gray area right here and hit hide show tree items i'm going to take a second and over here where it says equations you can set it to default show right and then again save your template and it'll always show uh, i'm going to hit okay now i'm going to make sure that i've got access to it and i'm going to create equations and global variables. I'm going to sign things like length and width and other things right here. So I'm going to hit manage equations. And when I do, I've got this menu, right? So if I want to add a global variable, just left mouse click on that gray text. And for this demo, let's do one called length or we'll do L and we're in inches units. So I'm going to make this two. I'm just going to type in the number two. And as I hit the tab, it works straight across and it goes it does what here, it says evaluates to. Now if I had like two plus three and I hit evaluates to, it now shows I can write equations in there. So that's where the value equation comes in. And these things can get as crazy as you want. You want to put in secant, cosecant, cotangent, tangent, whatever you need to put in, you can put these in, right? Maybe you want to do percentages, you, you, you have free reign over it, right? 
and just make sure that it evaluates to mat, uh, matches up to what you think it's going to match up to in your equations, right? So in this case, excuse me, I'm going to leave it at two and over here in the comments. So let's say I'm working on this file and I send it over to Darcy and Darcy's going to work on it. He doesn't know what L is, but let's just type in length. And then when I'm done typing here, I'm just going to hit the tab key and it puts me back into the adding a global variable. So we did length now I'm going to do a W and let's make it five. And again, my evaluates two all is just an express, uh, what this equation is here. Here's just five and five. We'll type in width. And then the last one, I'm going to type in a T and we're going to type in one and that's going to be the thickness of our part. Oh man. Obviously it's live. <laughs> so now I've got three variables, right? And these are just L, W, and T, and I'm gonna hit OK. And that sets my global variables, and I hit OK. And so now what I wanna do is I wanna sketch on my front plane, and I'm gonna just do a corner rectangle, and I'm gonna just drag and drop this guy kinda out here in space, right? And now what I need to do is associate dimensions with my equations over here. So there's a little chevron to the left of equations and you can see L, W, and T. So I'm gonna put smart dimension on this side and this is gonna be my length. And now what I have to do is link this value to the letter L. So in your dimension modifier, right here where it says 3.5, blah, 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 it's blue. If you just hit the equal key on your keyboard, move down to global variables, hit the letter L, right? And so, I now have, a, um, I'm gonna assign this one first. Again, I'm gonna hit the dimension, I'm gonna hit the equal key, global variable, I'm gonna hit the W, and I'm gonna hit the check mark, right? And what we'll notice is, I'm just gonna pick out here in space, that there's a little red E next to the two and the five. Don't panic, this is not an error. Right? Normally when we're sketching something and we see something pop up in red like uh, our, our constraints, it's over constrained or something's over defined. This doesn't mean an error. This is the summation symbol for some and some people look at it and say, okay, this just means in SolidWorks there's an equation in our global variable associated to that dimension, right? So here's where it kind of it comes into play, right? So I'm designing this in front of the customer and I want to use my shortcut bar and I want to extrude this out. I can either go up here, start fumbling around with features, find boss extrude, or if I'm right here, if I just hit the S key, guess what? Boss extrude is sitting right here in front of me. I never took the customer's eyes off the screen and I automatically hit S. I'm already in boss extrude. Now all I have to do is go over here to the right, or I'm sorry, to the left. I'm going to hit the equal key here in the dimension, right? And I'm going to set this thickness to the letter T, right? And so now I've created this part and it's a two by five by one, right? If I want to go edit it, guess what? I'm going to, it'll do it real time. I'm going to try and move this down where you can see, let's change this thickness from five to three. And when I click on the next cell down or a different cell there, you can see that this automatically updates. Now, this is huge. When, when we get into the putter uh, demonstration here at the very end, I'm going to show you a global list and there's probably 60 or 70 variables in in my list okay that's fine just know what they are know what they're associated to and how you're going to use them and so I set these up so that I'm not sitting there trying to create crazy sketches and profiles in front of the customer I'm doing it live and if I'm just quickly coming in here changing this and my model is changing in the background and I'm not having a bunch of errors and trying to figure out what's associated to what and who, where, when, and why, guess what? It's going to be impressive to the people you're sitting with, right? So let's hit OK. And now our part is rebuilt. We can obviously save this part. And I'm going to save it. Uh, let's save it in that small business growth summit folder that we got on our desktop. Boom. Uh, desktop. And we're going to go over here to our small business growth. We'll save it in global variables and equations. We've got part six and we're going to hit save, right? So we've got that stored in our folder. And again, if I come back over here to my library over on the right, there's my folder 
If I double click on it, there's my part six, right? So if I accidentally close it, double click it, and now all of a sudden it's gonna go quickly open that file. Now, what if I'm gonna create a whole bunch of these parts? Kind of the, uh, some firepower that's associated with these global variables and equations is that you can export them and link them to a new file, right? And so this may happen to you where you do one part in front of a customer and you, you, you can export these global variables to start a new part. So let's go right here and hit manage equations. And I've got these three and I wanna transfer them to a brand new file and I want these variables to control that file. So I'm gonna hit export and we'll just call this equations text. And it's a text file and we're gonna hit okay. And it's gonna say, yeah, do I wanna replace it. And when I do, you're gonna get this pop-up, right? And this pop-up is basically gonna say, what are the variables that you want to extract, right? And I wanna extract all of these. These means I've got the equation and variable and this is means that it's linked. If I wanna unlink it, I can. I can, we're going to do that in the, in, in, in the new part that we create. So let's hit export and hit OK. And let's hit new and let's go to just to hit a part and let's hit OK, right? Now the first thing I'm going to do is I want to bring in those global variables and equations. So I'm going to right click on equations, manage equations. I'm going to click on my import button and I'm going to go grab that equations file that, that equations.txt file, I'm gonna hit okay. And it's again, this pop-up, we just saw it for exporting, right? So now we're bringing this guy in, there we go. And we're bringing in all these variables and we're gonna say import them all. And don't panic here. You're gonna get three little cautionary triangles. All this means is these are not cautioned because the variable is still good and the variable is still linked. If I want to unlink it, notice how it goes from gray to a black and I can actually change the value in my file. For right now, I'm going to leave them linked, okay? These are just cautionary because there's no sketch for them to reassociate or attach them to. So I'm just going to hit okay. And you're going to get this syntax error and that's just coming from this right here. We're just going to say, okay, we understand that, right? And so now when I go to my front, I'm going to do a sketch I'm gonna pick on the same as we did before. I'm gonna say corner rectangle, bang, and I'm just gonna pick here and notice here, look, it's already come in and it's already brought in my three by five. And now if I hit my S key, I hit my extrude boss base, guess what? It's already linking the thickness here. So I've brought in all my variables and in just a few seconds in front of the customer, maybe the first one was a plate that had a bunch of hole cutouts. Maybe this one is some type of plate that has a center cutout with a bunch of slotting on it, right? So now all of a sudden I was able to quickly create that part using those global variables. If I want to unlink them, I absolutely can. All you have to do is uncheck it and let's change this five from a one. And I'm gonna pick on link and I'm gonna hit okay. Now I broke the link from there to the original and now I've changed this to a one by one by five right? I use these when I'm in front of the customer to kind of hopefully impress them about how quickly I can create parts. Click, 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 click. And I'm not fumbling around looking for files. Um, let's talk about, um, and I know Steve Darcy is, is helping us out today. Again, if you guys have any questions and I'm going too fast, there's going to be a Q&A at the end. And again, everybody's microphone is muted. But if you have any Q&As, uh, at the bottom of your screen, click on the Q&A and send it in. And I hope you have questions. And we will answer every one of them, whether it's today or, or we follow up with you. So I'm not going to save this. And I'm going to close everything down. And let's talk about display states. Again, I can either go up here and hit File. Or I can just go over here to Display States in my there. And I can just drag and drop. He's opening up. And there's our new model, right? So we've got this tank and the customer has, wants to make two configurations of it. They've got a 1500 series and a 2500 series, right? Again, to know how to create configurations and it may be on the 1500 series, it's just a standard tank, right? This is just a water tank, right? And they're made here, this company's here in Austin. And maybe on the 2500 series, 
it's kind of the like the uh, the King W ranch to the Ford F-150. You can buy an F-150 standard or you can buy the King W. But maybe the 2500 has uh, the manhole covers, the internal plumbing, everything's already set up with bulkheads kind of placed down here at the bottom. But you also have access to colors, whereas with the standard one, maybe the 1500, you only have access to a black or a gray tank. So what we want to do is we want to create some configurations. And the first one I'm going to do is I'm going to create a configuration I hit 1500 and if I'm adding or taking away features I'm gonna use suppress features I'm gonna hit my green check okay right and there's my configuration and I'm gonna go up here and I'm gonna hit add a configuration and I'm gonna call it 2500 and so quickly I created 200 two configurations right but I want to create these tanks where the 1500 has just black and gray right so I've got a gray that's kind of the default right but where do I create these display states? Like I want to show the customer their product in different colors. So if you'll notice at, in your configurations tab, kind of down here at the bottom, there's display states. And there's the default display state and I can rename it. The one thing I want to do is I'm going to click on properties and I want to make sure that I click this button here. This link of display states to configuration I'm going to check it because what this does is when I create a display state in the 1500, those colors are only applied to the 1500 model. Again, we have just a black and a gray in this scenario for the 1500, and we're going to create a red and a blue and a green over for the 2500, but we don't want those pushing over to the 1500. So let's hit OK to add a display state, right click on it, and hit Add Display State. And I've added one. I'm going to hit right display state. I'm going to do two of them, right? I'm going to do add display state. And I can rename a right click on it. Um, rename tree item. And we'll call this one gray, which is the same as the default we have right now. And let's do an add display state. Oops, sorry. Right click on it. Uh, rename display state. I can also dis delete the display state that if it's gray. Prompt. Yep, there it goes. Obviously showing you this is a live demo. And I want to rename it. And we're gonna call this one black, All right? And so now what I want to do is I want to go over here to my uh, appearance scenes and decals, and I'm just gonna drag this part over, right? I'm gonna apply appearance to it. These are uh, uh, a plastic tanks, uh, 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 polyethylene tanks rather, and I just want to apply a medium gloss. And if I scroll down here to the bottom over on the right, I'm just gonna apply this black to it, and I'm gonna to say to the body, right? I can also apply it to a feature. Now when I go to gray, I have a gray tank and a black tank. So now when I'm sitting in front of the customer and they're like, hey, we've got the 1500, the 1500 comes in gray and black. Cool. The 2500 comes in red, blue, and green. Notice I don't have any of those display states. So again, I'm just going to do a red. I'm going to add a couple and then I'll rename them. Uh, again, I want to make sure my properties, let's make sure that's checked. Just double check yourself. And we'll add three, right? And we'll add a display state. And let's rename it. And we'll do red, blue, and green. Red. Uh, we'll rename this guy. All I'm doing is right clicking on it, rename tree item blue. And we're going to do this one red. And then we're going to do this one, uh, rename tree item green, right? Now, when I'm in the green, I'm going to go over here. I'm going to see if I've got a green. I'm going to apply it to the part. I'm going to apply it to the body when I go to the blue one. I'm going to apply this blue. And you guys get it, right? So now when I walk into that customer, I make sure I'm in that correct display state. And you know which one's active by this one's dark and these are grayed out. I'm just going to drag my red over, right? And oops. I'm going to hit this and I'm going to hit the body, right? But maybe in this red one here, guess what? We can actually do a black paint fill in here. So I can drag this paint. When I drag this paint fill over just this text, this actually says, hey, I just want to use this feature right here. The second one is a feature. The first one is a face. This one is a feature. So I wanted all that feature to be paint filled. And so now I can really get into some crazy customization in front of the customer. So I'm sitting in front of them and I got a putter and I know that they've offered putters in black They've offered putters in gray, red, green, whatever the case is. I've already got these set up, right? And if 
A customer says, Dave, what does it look like on the 1500? Well, this is what you're, again, this is what it does. And this is how quick it is. If you're set up, this is going to impress your customers. If you have all these things set up before you get in there, it's going to show them that you're competent in your skills and that you've researched and you studied their product and you care about their product, right? Again, they're entrusting you with their product, right? Show them that you care and you've, that you've done your research. So we've done all this, right? So let's think about what we've done. We've, we've set up our settings. We've set up our templates. We've set up our global variables. We've set up sketches. We know how to do display states. And here's what we're gonna do next. We're gonna do, go do a live demo. Not that this hadn't been, but I'll walk you through one of the demos that how I set mine up. So I set all my global variables up. And when I do new, under my templates directory, I have a folder. If I pick on each one, it'll show me the preview again over here. So I've got putter and this TS stands for triplane sole. And the AM stands for arc mid body. FB for me stands for flat bumper and then an inch. And then I'm going to pick on it, right? And as soon as I pick on it, notice that my sketches are in there and I already have these sketches predefined. I already have my equations. Let's go look at this manage equations. There is a ton of equations in here, right? The last thing I want to be doing is I want to be able to adjust the model to get it to weight or to some specification real quick, real easy in front of the customer. Bam. I want to keep their focus right here on the screen. I don't want them up here looking around. If they're up here looking around, you know, you're losing, you're losing the customer interest in what you're doing. Now, I've got three face profiles. Three sketches already done. And I name everything in my files. Face profile, body profile, center cavity. I've also got an axis that I created and I've got a lofted plane. I've already got this plane. And we're gonna use this plane to cut away material of our parts. So I'm gonna roll back. And the first thing I'm gonna do is, they're like, hey Dave, we want a triplane, triplane sole putter. And we're gonna create it with an arc to mid body and flat bumpers. Cool. So all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pick on the face profile and there's how it turns blue and I'm going to move my mouse kind of over here to the screen I'm going to hit the S key and I'm going to do extrude boss base now inside of this sketch let me back up a second um, I'm going to edit this sketch for just a second these are all the dimensions in just this profile now I have multiple sketches and multiple contoured regions in this one sketch again these are all variables tied to my equations, right? And global variables. I have everything set up, right? Again, studied my customer. I studied their face profile. So when I went in there, I had these predefined. Whether they wanted a triplane sole or a radius sole, I had it available, right? So now I'm set up. I pick on it. I'm going to hit the S key and I'm just going to hit extrude boss base, right? And at this point, I've got a couple things going on. In your feature manager, the first thing it's going to ask you is it's blue and it's going, hey, what do I want to extrude, right? And the first thing you want to pick is pick this outer profile. And you can see here now that I'm actually extruding that body in this direction. Well, I want to reverse it. And where it says a length or this blind depth, I'm going to hit the equal key. I'm going to hit global variables and I'm going to hit my top line thickness. It's going to take a second. And I'm just going to hit my green check. Bam. There's top line thickness. I'm going to rename this. I, you know, I'm a little bit of a stickler about this. And we may not do it today because we're doing it live and in a hurry. But I'm going to call this top line. And I like to name all my features. So let's say I send this file over and I've hired a subcontractor. And let's say Steve Darcy is the contractor. I send this file to Steve Darcy. If I don't have anything named and he's getting errors or we can't figure out what's going on, and I've got 300 features in that feature tree, it's a pain to kind of go through and sort out where the problems are, right? So name everything so when you get an error or something's going on, it'll tell you it's in the top line or it's in the body profile sketch or it'll tell you where it is. SolidWorks is pretty good about that, right? So now I've got that original sketch and I want to access it again. Now, here's something kind of funny. Um, you'll notice that this sketch face profile 
you normally has this look to it, right? When I have one sketch in one profile, one enclosed region in a sketch, your sketch underneath this top line is going to look like this. And this one kind of looks like a dead sockeye salmon, right? Like he's kind of facing up like he's floating upside down, right? Well, it's not a dead fish. It's not a dead sockeye. All that means is it's a sketch with multiple contours, right? So all I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight it. I'm going to click on it one time. And notice how it turned blue. I'm going to hit the S key. And I'm going to do extrude boss base again. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do something a little sneaky. I'm going to go pick my two contoured regions. But I'm going to switch the plane and the face in which I started from. I'm going to pick this back face. Boom. I'm going to reverse that direction and the thickness of the part. I'm going to hit global variables and I'm going to hit mid body thickness. So you can see how quickly I can start to create this part. Now I'm going to pick on my body profile. I'm going to hit my S key. And I've already added in things uh, like surfacing to my S key, right? It's already there. So I'm going to do an extruded surface. And I'm going to do a mid plane. And I'm going to make this like three inches, right? So it's a pretty big plane sitting out there, right? Cool. I'm going to go back to this face profile here. I'm going to hit my S key. You can see how quickly this starts to go, right? Because I'm set up. I've, I've prepared for success, right? That's what today is all about. I'm going to pick this zone. I'm going to say up to surface. I'm going to pick this back region. And I'm going to say OK. And see how quickly we are creating this part. Now all I have to do is create my center cavity. Boom. I'm going to pick on the S key. And I'm going to do an extruded cut. Uh, in this case, I'm going to do a two direction cut. I'm going to say blind and I'm going to do the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start off this back face, right? I'm going to make sure that this one goes through all. And in my second direction, it's going to go in a reverse direction, but I'm going to make it blind and I'm going to set this at, at 60 thou deep. Now, what this is, this is a cavity that goes in the back of the putter head. It helps me remove weight, it helps me establish the MOI of the putter. And what it does is it gives me a place for branding. And, and lastly, what it'll do is it'll also give me an area where I can start to tune the sound of this putter, right? And about somewhere around 60 thou is, is, is ideal. And so I'm just going to hit the green check OK. I'm going to say OK. Boom. And now I've started to put this putter in place. And now I'm going to roll down. I've got that plane activated. I'm going to pick the plane. I'm going to hit the S key. And I'm going to do, I'm going to do a cut with surface, right? And notice that I've got a little arrow right here. This arrow tells me I'm cutting everything away from this plane. I'm going to actually hit the reverse button. And now I'm cutting the loft of the putter in. So I'm going to go back. I'm going to hide a few sketches. I'm going to hide a few planes. I'm going to make sure that I've got a nice clean model. And in just a few seconds, I've turned a few sketches off. I've actually created this putter in front of the customer. So now, if I want to put some fillets on it, guess what? I hit my S key. I've added fillets to it. Let's start adding some fillets to maybe this edge and this edge. Just kind of get you showing you some things here. Uh, and see how quick and easy this is to put these fillets in. And now I can start. And in just a few minutes, I've got a putter that the customer can see fully. And it is ready to go, right? So now we're focused on cosmetics. We're focused on shape, uh, MOI, whatever they're trying to focus on. And in just a few seconds, I've got that. And if I want to go adjust my equations, manage equations, guess what? They thought that top line looked too thick. So I'm going to go change this top line thickness from 0.4. I'm going to make it 0.6. Oops. 0.6. I'm going to hit OK. It updates not only here, but it goes in and rebuilds my model. And you can now see that this top line is much thicker, right? So again, I'm right in front of the customer. The customer is focused on their part. They're not focused on my feature tree. They're not focused on my, all my tabs and pretty colors. They're focused on their model and they're telling me what they want. And you can focus on what the customer wants and the customer can focus on what they want. And you show them these things and you're prepared for these things. Just like what we showed today, you're going to have a greater chance of success. So um, let me hit something here. Let's get back to this. So that was our SolidWorks preparation side.
So I want to tell you guys the rest of that little putter story. So I got the contract. I thought that I didn't. It, I honestly thought this is a disaster when I was in that meeting. And somehow I won the contract and I got that putter contract. And I came home and I worked hard to figure out ways so that I never had to go through that painful experience again, right? And that's just kind of a culmination of those things, right? And I want to share them with you because we want you to be successful. And every one of these little tips and tricks that we have, we're going to share with you in this summit series, right? And so when I went to future design contracts, I sat down and I just quickly knock out models. I've had a pretty good success rate of winning contracts. The question is, and, and Chad's getting ready to jump in here. Chad, you still there, buddy? Yes, I am. Yep. All right, cool, brother. So let's say the scenario, and this has happened to me, and I've done it the hard way. And, you know, like I get the contract. I won the contract. And I go, cool. But I was set up for success on the SolidWorks side, right? But do I have the keys and the ideas and the the tips and tricks to be successful on the business side, I did not. And I'll be honest with you, I, I, I'm, I was, you know, I was not prepared for success on some levels, right? I was prepared to know how to use my SolidWorks to win the contract, but from a business side, totally wasn't as ready as I needed to be, right? And so the question now comes is, how do we, as in this investment into you guys that are watching and, 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 and participating today is how do we give back to you from the business side? Because it's more than just solid work. So Chad, I'm going to hit stop screen on my side. I'm going to let you share your screen. And if you'll share your screen, we'll pop in there. And then I'm going to let you run with that presentation. All right. And go ahead. Nick. Yeah, you go. Cool. Perfect. All right. So, Thank you, Dave. Uh, David, I um, I learned more about what you do in the last 30 minutes than I think we have <laughs> in, uh, in the five years that I've known you. I've uh, just seen what you're doing. We've talked about it, but actually seeing that is really impressive. Uh, makes me want to go get my golf clubs and actually maybe go have you design some for me or something Sweet. like that. Sweet. I know you have a ton of free time right now. Oh, yeah. It's just <laughs> nothing to do, so, man. There's a, free time's everywhere between – Trying to figure out virtual learning and uh, go engineer and my personal company. There's just so much free time. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so um, before I get into what I what I'm here today to talk about the uh, whether or not you're, you're going to hire an employee or a contractor, I want to point out something uh, that you know, or just elaborate on something that David pointed out um, about uh, getting the work, understanding how to do um, your your skill, your expertise, but then there's, but as a business owner, there's so many other things that you have to do that are not necessarily uh, aligned with your technician work or your technical work. Um, if you guys haven't already, go out and find a book. It's called The E Myth. Um, I didn't read it for a very long time because I thought it had something to do with the, you know, the internet or uh, e marketing or something of that nature. But it's not. The E Myth stands for the Entrepreneur Myth. Um, it's been around for quite a while. Uh, get the book. It's called The E-Myth Revisited. Read it. It's a quick read. And um, it will help you understand where you are as an entrepreneur. If you're a business owner, um, you have three hats to wear, right? The entrepreneur, the guy that said, you know what? I can do this better than my current provider or, or, or boss. Or, you know what? I want to do this myself, right? That's the entrepreneur. Then you got the manager that's going to, like, buy all your, your, your pens and your paper and your yeah. clips and all that stuff and mm -hmm. put all the get calendars in place and then you have the technician right the person who's going to actually do the work the person who's going to build the putter um all three of those people are inside you and they're fighting for control at every at any given time so mm -hmm. you have to figure out a way that's going to work for you to to manage all three of those people inside you or else you, your, your technician ends up winning and, mm -hmm. and uh, you end up working 20 hours a week yeah. Or 20 hours a day, I'm sorry. Not 20 hours a week. 20 hours a week would be good. 20 yeah. hours a day, not so well. <laughs> yeah. but, um, just so that uh, we get back to what you asked me to do, uh, mm -hmm. we're going to talk about um, hiring an employee. Um, at this point, we're assuming you've, you've uh, 
you have, you have won some contracts and maybe it's a little bit more work than what you were yeah. are set up or that you feel comfortable mm-hmm. doing yourself. Maybe you need to hire some, some help, whether it's mm-hmm. going to be an employee or a contractor. We're going to mm-hmm. talk about uh, employees and contractors. We're going to get a little bit more depth of what happens if you hire an employee, um, what happens if you hire a contractor, and then what do you do for your HR and payroll and benefits of that nature, right? There's a, little, there's a, a lot of difference between mm-hmm. the two. So we're going to focus on uh, the differences. And right now, uh, I'm going to minimize the, there we go. So there are some major differences between an employee and an independent contractor. And it's, and what's really important here is to understand those differences because the IRS will come and get you if you uh, (laughs) mislabel somebody, uh, if you, if you treat them as a contractor, but or if you're paying them as a contractor, but they're actually an employee, mm. it doesn't matter what kind of paperwork you've got in front of you. If you're treating them like an employee, but you have them on paper as a contractor, you're in trouble, right? Mm-hmm. So we, we want to avoid that. And uh, <clears throat> my job uh, today is to kind of go over that. stuff. We are going to talk about some differences here, right? So um, for an employee, you have got this continuing uh, relationship with, with, uh, with them. With a contractor, they're going to come and go as uh, as work uh, dictates, mm-hmm. right? You might bring them on for one job or two jobs or three jobs, but when that work is over, they go away. Um, the the employee is there whether you have work or not. Second difference here um, with an employee, you're furnishing them with all of their tools, all of their education, all the materials they're going to need. They, they show up and they've got a workstation or they've got a desk or whatever it is, or they work from home with the stuff that you've provided them, and they, they do that. Mm-hmm. The independent contractor is supposed to come to this with their own education, with their own tools, uh, and uh, their own staff even, mm-hmm. right? So how many of y'all at this point, if you can in the chat, uh, I'm not going to be monitoring this, but i got some help here. How many of y'all currently hire independent contractors? And um, also, how many of you have employees? That would be nice uh, to know. Um, but uh, we'll, back to the presentation here. When we are talking about contractors and bringing their own tools, um, generally that's what they're going to do. I understand that a lot of you are, are uh, manufacturers and you might have uh, very specialized tools or whatever it is, or some kind of specialized software like Visco Engineer. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm sorry, with SolidWorks, and I understand that um, you have certain uh, licenses with them. Mm-hmm. But if you had something very specific, uh, it's not crazy for you to have that that contractor to come in and use your stuff. But it's only for that specific job, right? If they're not taking it with them forever. Yeah, Chad, can I jump in there? Sure. Hey, man, I got a great question. So. That happened to me in a scenario where, so when you have SolidWorks, um, you ha- you can put the solid the license on two machines, right? I can load it onto, say, I have a desktop engineering system, and I also have a laptop so that I can do uh, my my live presentations in front of my customer all around the country, right? But you can only have the the license active on one of the two, right? I can't have I can't be using SolidWorks. For for on my desktop station for customer A and then hand my laptop off to customer, the contractor I hire and say, go work on this. The, the licenses won't allow that, right? SolidWorks puts a stop to that, right? And so um, to be honest with you, Chad, and you and I talked about this a little bit before, is like when when I interview, uh, uh, viewed people, to contractors to come in, if they told me they didn't have SolidWorks, that was a huge red flag for me because I went like, you're applying for a job where we're actually going to, I'm either going to put you in a building that you have to use SolidWorks, one, that might be a customer, right? Like say maybe it's company B and they've got SolidWorks and they want to use, they want the me, the contractor, to use it in their building, right? So I'm hiring somebody to go in that building and use their SolidWorks. That's one scenario, right? But if, if somebody is going to work and you're trying to interview them, and you're trying to, to validate their skill set because ultimately they represent you, right? You can't have, if they don't have the software, for me personally, I'd be like, nah, I'm not hiring that person. Right, so a scenario where 
an employee or, or an independent contractor may have the experience but doesn't have the software, it might be for for uh, one of the one of your clients that has somebody that has retired um, that only wants to do a little bit of part time yeah. work, mm-hmm. and uh, so you know that they have the mm-hmm. skill set, but they're not maintaining a, a license mm-hmm. on uh, SolidWorks every yeah. year. It, you know, they're only going to do a couple things a year. Mm-hmm. So you know that they have the ability to come in here. And and, and uh, like you and I had talked about before, mm-hmm. uh, if you're interviewing an independent contractor, you're going to make them go build something or give you some kind of model to prove that they can actually do that. Um, yes, sir. Especially within your, in your field. A hundred percent. Yeah, and I, I forgot to mention that, guys, and, and, and ladies that are, that are watching in, is like, as someone who has hired contractors and someone, you know, before I hire that contractor, I will give them a blueprint and I will have them make a model and it may not be a crazy complex model depending on the work that's done, but I'm going to give them something that's got enough, it's going to give me enough confidence to know that this person knows how to use the software. So I would, before you hire any contractor, my personal recommendation is have some type of test or model that they have to create. Right, because uh, that, that's one of the differences between an employee mm-hmm. and the contractors. The contractor should already have these skill sets, right? Yeah. That's one of the benefits. Yep. And we're going to cover that here in a minute, too, okay. of having a contractor. You might hire an employee that has never seen SolidWorks before, mm-hmm. but you know that coming in, right? Mm-hmm. And um, uh, and you're going to train them. But mm-hmm. you might also have some uh, employees that have uh, are, are potential employees that have experience somewhere else but don't have a have a license of their own yeah. either. And you can bring them in and have them do a little test as part of their interview. Okay, Nothing cool. wrong with that either. Thanks. So uh, another difference between employees and contractors is that an employee can quit at any time. You can fire them for the most part at any time as well here in Texas. Um, we're going to get into more details on that on, on the independent contractor, but it's not that easy um, potentially to, to get rid of an independent contractor. Uh, an independent contractor can also make a profit or suffer a loss, right? They're, they're mm-hmm. bidding on a project and uh, hopefully they run their bids properly and they're gonna make a profit. Uh, but your employee is gonna get paid whether you make a profit or not, um, at least for a little while. <laughs> <So> <laughs> the goal is to make profits, um, but the employee is not dependent upon that, um, like the contractor. So another difference here is that uh, an employee they have to show up when you say to they work at a certain place they have to do what you say to for the most part um, what you say to do uh, they have to do what you say and you, they have to follow certain protocols and procedures and all these other things that you, you tell them there, there are rules right that they have to follow um, not as much with the independent contractor you really are hiring them to be experts to take care of something and they set their own schedule within reason uh, depending on where you are and what the work is, uh, you might have something where they've got to go on site for a client mm-hmm. uh, to to build some flanges or whatever on a like a, at a uh, like a power plant or something of that nature where they're I don't know what you're going to be doing, uh, but they might have to go out there. Well, the end client is going to like kind of dictate when that's even possible. That's okay, but you are allowing your contractor to work with them to figure out okay. what that schedule is. It's not on you. Uh, for the most part um, and we kind of touched on this already the uh, uh, an employee is going to be trained by trained by you and hopefully uh, it, well depending on what you're doing your your subcontractor is going to have any kind of business license that are required um, I could give a ton of examples where that would be necessary and some that are not but if whatever you're doing requires a license and they need it they would have that okay so let's focus on what happens if you hire an employee. All right, so I'm gonna go through all of the different things, and this is just really not even all. This is a, a high level of all of the, a lot of things you'd have to do if you hire somebody as an employee. Uh, you have to register with the IRS as an employer. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you started off as solo uh, manures. Um, I know David did, and there's probably a lot of you that are like that. And if you ever brought on an employee, hopefully you did all these things. If you did, it's not too late to, to fix it, uh, but you might want to make sure that you do. Uh, so you have to register with the IRS. You need to do those W-4s. That's where you're going to be getting their tax information. And you're going to register that with the IRS, their personal information. Uh, you're going to do I-9s and, to, and, and you verify their eligibility. Um, 
we're not going to get into into a lot of detail on there, but um, there are ways uh, to verify that make sure that your employees are here legally to do whatever they're supposed to be doing. Um, and if you follow these rules, if they are committing fraud on you, you're not at it's not your fault, right? So you've got to follow through all these eligibility. Um, you have to confirm that they're eligible to work in the United States. If not, um, and you didn't do these things, well, then you're at fault, right? They're coming after you too. So all employees should complete an application. And I was telling Dave that I kind of want to uh, point out some reasons why, right? Uh, to fill out an application, you're going to to do that application. Um, they're going to agree to the job description that you have provided for them so that they understand what their scope of work is um, and what is expected of them. And you're also going to get uh, the referrals, the references, and, uh, and, and that you can follow up with to make sure that they really are who they say they are and that they have the experience that they have, uh, that they say they have. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, most people are not going to give uh, re references uh, that are going to give them bad references but what they do is they'll list out where they work and then you can contact and make sure that they've even heard of these people yeah. you're also going to see what kind of certifications they have and you can verify whether or not they have those certifications or that they do have an engineering degree um i was telling david that uh when i first got out of the army i went to work with a recruiting firm that was all military and we worked with uh, military folks coming out of the military and, and putting them in jobs right and uh, one of our clients uh, was a big military, they get a lot of military contracts, a lot of federal contracts with the military, and they were in a rush and they needed a bunch of engineer project, ma project managers that have an engineering background. And so we put a number of potential candidates in front of them and they inter interviewed them and they really liked uh, this one guy in particular. He was. Um, he had a very compelling story. He was an engineer from a top school, had great grades, uh, had his um, transcripts and everything ready to go. He was a uh, had been shot. He was a Purple Heart, you know, recipient. Wow. Um, uh, he was a Special Forces. All of these things look great on paper. We started verifying his information because they kind of hired him in a hurry. Uh, him and about six other people. They started following up also come to find out the guy was a code full of fraud oh man He'd never gone to college and um uh he wasn't an engineer he wasn't mm -hmm. he had never been in the military and, oh my goodness uh, so without that application you know you you wouldn't be able to follow up on that stuff so you have to trust but verify does that make sense yeah hey, hey chad there that's that's crazy but i'm sure it happens so uh, that happens. Is it fraud? Is that person committing fraud? And or like as a business owner, am I on the hook for that? Even it, uh, okay. Depends on whether or not you were doing all these things to follow up. If you didn't have them do the application and you weren't following up to verify these things, well then, you know, if your end client finds that mm -hmm. out first, then oh. it could be a problem because oh, they, yeah. they've been paying this person based on uh, false information yeah. the uh the person that's committing the fraud is definitely theft by fraud that's a whole another criminal matter yeah but more just as important i should say i don't know if it's more important but just as important is the the hit to your reputation right mm -hmm. so you've got to verify that these people really are who they are who they say they are and that they have the skill sets that you say they have right people will embellish that's one thing but mm -hmm. flat out lying to you is a whole nother yeah all right cool uh, you also have to register with the state employment agencies, uh, workforce commission, um, comptroller, all of that. As an employee, if you're hiring employees, you got to make sure that you're following OSHA standards, which means you probably need to find out what they are. Um, and if you're going to be manufacturing things or working with different types of chemicals, um, you need to have MSDS sheets. And that could even be uh, the pine salt that you have in there or the, the bleach 
or whatever it is that you might have. You need to have the MSDS sheet so that your employees can see what they're working with. Uh, you need to have an employee handbook. This is what's going to keep them uh, on track. This is going to be a, a way for you to make sure that you can fire them if need be, or at least counsel them to the point where they are good employees or you know, uh, counsel them right out the door. You need to keep all these, uh, all your forms on file at least four years, preferably, you know, well, actually for employees the entire time they're there. Uh, it's for, for contractors, it's up at least four years. So workers' compensation. Um, in Texas, if you can self-insure, you don't have to have workers' compensation insurance, but most people are not. That's more like on the, the lines like a Walmart or a Target or something huge. Um, uh, they can be self-insured. You need to make sure that you get workers' compensation. And I know it's an expense and it's not necessarily cheap, but you know what's not cheap? Is having to pay for that out of pocket um, and not have a plan for that. So insurance is way better. Now, in Texas, we it's a right to work state, and that means you can fire anybody at any given time for the most part, but you still have to have processes in play. You can't just come in and fire somebody because they looked at you wrong, right? I mean, they, there are rules um, on firing people, and that's where that handbook comes into play mm -hmm. um, and counseling them and then, uh, and then letting them go, right? So, yeah. or you can, they can quit too. Right, mm -hmm. they're not on an employment contract, so they can quit on you. Mm -hmm. um, okay, hey Chad, I got a question on that yeah. right to work here. Sure. And and you can correct me if I'm wrong. You know, there's all kinds of myths, and never believe anything you see on the internet, right? But um, let's say uh, one of the things I've always heard was that if you're fired, let's say I work for a, a golf company. Uh, both of these no longer manufacture golf clubs, so this is probably okay. Let's say I worked for Nike Golf, and um, we have two scenarios. So, so scenario one would be I worked for Nike Golf, and I was terminated, and I went to work for Adams Golf. Again, they're now defunct as well, but um, one, would that non-compete still stand in place? And then I guess the second would be, the scenario would be, well, I worked for Nike, I, I went out, I, I sought the job at Adams, I got the job at Adams. What happens, am, am I, is there a lawsuit? Kind of, can you kind of just kind of walk through those two scenarios for, for those listening in, and myself as sure. well? Right on, so the um, the short answer, really, that any good attorney is gonna tell you is that, is that it depends. <laughs> so we're gonna move on, no, I'm kidding. Uh, no, it really depends on a lot of, uh, on a lot of, variables if you were terminated from nike golf um because they had a reduction in force you know they, they quit making golf clubs mm -hmm. then they would probably re release you from that uh non-compete right okay. if they no longer have a job for you because they just don't have jobs mm -hmm. available for that thing then they're going to release mm -hmm. you from your non-compete but if they didn't it was it's still a contract and um so it would be in place okay in a situation like that they probably would release you from it okay. if you got terminated because you know you were a bad employee um they may uh let you out of that contract or they might keep you into that contract okay. right you're not like, well look you're such mm -hmm. a bad employee we'd love for you to go to work for our competitor mm -hmm. okay. i got you um <laughs> so it just really depends but those non-competes have to be reasonable and i know we kind of talked about this mm -hmm. but what is reasonable Generally, they run around between two to five years. Anything over five years in Texas is, is just totally not reasonable. I mean, there's, there's, there's a law behind that. There's court cases that are saying that that's just not reasonable. It also has to be reasonable in the area or like what exactly – it has to be reasonable in geographic too, right? They can't say if you're here in Austin, you can't work uh, for a competitor in the state of Texas or in the United States, mm -hmm. right? That's just not – not reasonable they could say within 20 miles of our location okay which would cover a lot of austin yeah you know, i mean even some of the outside areas okay um and it you know we talked about the time frame um so it has to be reasonable in, those, in, mm -hmm. in that that fashion okay. it also can't be so restrictive that you can't um practice your career whatever it mm -hmm. is that you want to be so yeah. if you're an engineer um, they can't say you can't work for any other engineering firm, you know, in Austin. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, 
at all. Right? Okay. So there would be, you maybe can't work with these people in this type of area. Mm -hmm. You can still kind of go over to something else. So, okay. So it, let's say, okay, cool, man. Thank you for answering that. That's, that's great information. So let's say uh, I'm in a scenario where I was at Nike. I moved over to Adams, never thought about the non-compete, right? Just moved on. I'm working over there and I'm at there. And then someone at Nike goes, oh yeah, you know, Dave, I saw where he's working over at this other golf company. And somebody in HR goes, well, wait, we've got a non-compete. Would I have to leave my job at Adams in this scenario? And I know we're throwing two companies that are no longer making right. golf, but would I have so, to leave that B company or would there be some type of legal, legal ramification between the two or? Right. So it would depend. Um, okay. What they could do is uh, obviously the reason why a company would have a non-compete in place is because they, they feel like they would be disadvantaged. So if Adams hired you um, and you were under a, you know, an active NDA, mm -hmm. they would either have to let you go um, or they could settle with Nike with some kind of, uh, re re you know, restriction on what your scope is on what you're able to do. Okay. So you're not a direct competitor mm -hmm. or, you know, you aren't competing with them directly. Okay. Or they could pay them a settlement amount, like liquidated damages. Okay. Um, saying, well, okay, well, in lieu of us allowing him to work there, we want you to pay us $30,000 or $10,000 or okay. whatever it may be. Okay. So, but yeah, they could, they could okay. force it and say, wow. you know, and that's how they probably would start was like, mm. look, here's a copy of the NDA. It's valid. And we mm. want you to fire. Him. Wow. Okay. So, that it would, the settlement yeah. would, would start. Yeah. I always thought that, um, and, and prior to our conversations, and I guess I was a little ignorant on that, but thank you for sharing that for, for everybody because one of the thoughts was it's a right to work state. You leave a company, you can just go straight to company B and that, that non, because it's a right to work state, I could go wherever I wanted. But thanks for clarifying that. I appreciate that. Thanks. If you don't have a non-compete, then yes, right? Yeah. Um, but a non-compete is a contract. And okay. I know that a lot of people are like, oh, they're not worth the paper they're written on. That's not true. Okay. As long as they're narrowly tailored to that specific thing that you're doing for them mm -hmm. and there are legit competitors, um, then you would and you would have take your information that they have that you okay. earned or gained from working at Nike. Okay. Yeah, it's it, it would be it's a wow. contract and you're okay. bound by it because you sign okay. it and mm -hmm. you did get benefit. You got paid okay. salary or whatever it is. Okay, perfect. So let's focus. Uh, so, so before I move on to contractor, I want you to look at that list of things you got to do. This is just like the bare the bare minimum. Like there's a whole lot of sub things underneath every one of these. And I told you at the very beginning of this to, to, to read the myth, right? And this is one of the reasons why. You need to outsource this stuff. You do not want to be doing this yourself. If you have enough funds to hire an HR person, great. But you know what? You could also, um, especially if you're going to have employees, you're going to have to have someone doing your payroll. There are bookkeepers, there are CPAs um, that do this for you, and they would handle all of these things for you, uh, except for maybe the OSHA and MSDS sheets. Uh, that would be something that... Well, they might, um, mm -hmm. but ADP and paychecks, though, they also do these things for you for a fee, right? This is some of those costs that come associated with being an employer, but for a fee, they will handle all of these things. and They'll make sure that you're in compliance without a doubt. Okay. okay? If you try to do this all on your own, it's just so much, right? Mm -hmm. And you're being taken away from what you're good at or what you're, what you're best at, right? Which yeah. is probably driving new business or, mm -hmm producing the, the product that your um, your clients need cool. for a nominal fee in the grand scheme of things outsource the stuff to somebody else all right so now we're going to talk about contractors and, and we're at first we're going to talk a little bit about like what the pros and cons are and there's if you got pros there's generally cons there's no free lunch um, but when you're talking about contractors the first thing that I want to talk about is that you will probably save money, right? Because you're not having to pay those taxes. You're not providing them with health insurance. You're not providing them with some kind of um, health, uh, other types of benefits, life insurance, whatever it may be. Uh, you're not having to pay for um, an additional office space for them or internet or phones or whatever it is. There's these expenses that you're not going to be incurring yourself if you're passing them off to the um, to the contractor and I'm not a, not a CPA but I can tell you this right 
uh, when you're paying the independent contractor, that's going to be an expense line. It's not, I mean, it, it, it's a straight up, you can reduce your revenue um, by that expense. And again, talk to your CPA about that. So. But you're going to probably save money. Um, your staff, you have flexibility with the staff. As we mentioned earlier, you, you, you're you a solopreneur or you got four or five people working for you or maybe you got 50. Um, and then you end up getting a job, you know, like I know Tesla's coming into town and they're building out there um, out by the airport. And uh, they're going to be building a lot of stuff out there and they're going to need people to come in. And they're going to need uh, people to help them out for a very short period of time, but for a lot. It's going to be, you might need to have, go from 50 people to 200 people. Well, do you really want to hire 150 new people just to lay them off in six months when the work is done? No, you're going to hire subcontractors. Um, and so when the work is gone, so do they. They go and they find somewhere else to work. Um, that's flexibility. And you're not stuck with the mouths to feed. It's also going to reduce, potentially reduce your um exposure lawsuits and how that works is that each of your independent contractors depending on what you need but a lot of the time they're going to need to have some kind of uh, errors and omissions uh, or liability insurance of their own and you're going to ask them to add you as an additional insured so if they screw something up and you get sued um, your company gets sued it's their insurance your independent contractors insurance is going to pay for your defense so um, and hopefully um, if you have a, a good uh, subcontractor agreement, they're going to indemnify you, which means if there's anything wrong, they're going to fix it. Okay. So here we got to pay for that lunch, and um, you have less control with the contractors. We kind of talked about this before. They're not employees. They do whatever they need to do on their time schedule. Your workers come and go. Um, you don't have that continuity with uh, the the contractors because there's there's sometimes they're there sometimes they're not your employee your clients are going to see different people potentially rotating through doing the work for them as opposed to the same people and building that re relationship with the company um, your right to fire an independent contractor depends on the contract right depends on your uh, subcontractor agreement and uh, it might be you have to give them a 30-day notice or they have to be a material breach of the contract or Maybe the contract does, you don't have something right there because you didn't get someone to review it or draft it for you. And you don't even have a termination on or how to fire someone if they're not performing. It only terminates when the work is done. Okay. That can be horrible, right? So you need to have a subcontractor agreement and I'm sure you all have them. If you're using subcontractors, I'm sure you have subcontractor agreements, right? I mean, David, did you ever hire any uh, subcontractors? I did, yeah, and I had a, a very it was interesting. So the, the contractor agreements were written, you know, in a, in a myriad of ways, to be honest with you, because I did it more than once. So it was interesting. Some of them were paid different ways and some of them were paid, um, you know, some of them wanted a lump sum and some of them wanted periodic payments just for as an example. But yeah, each one of them was very specific as to when the job was to start and when the job was to finish, um, you know, and that, you know, I tried to put in things like bonuses. Like if you, if we're ahead of schedule and we get approved, there's a bonus involved. And if we're not, you know, it's kind of a penalty contract type thing on some of them. Um, but yeah, everything was detailed in there. Every I, I had to have it. Absolutely. Well, I work with people all the time that they contact me because something went wrong mm -hmm. and they didn't have a, a subcontract agreement. And it's oh, like, well, I, there's only a little bit of things I can do to help you out right now, but what I can do is help you going forward. So this doesn't happen. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, so if you don't have a properly drafted uh, subcontract agreement, um, you may not own the intellectual property or the client might not own it. Right. Because if you don't do this properly, I don't see this as often. Mm -hmm. Um, and I would imagine that a lot you and a lot of your uh, your clients are looking at this going, well, yeah, we all do a work for hire, right? I mean, we're developing things for them and they own it. Well, in your agreement with your end client, there is a work for hire um, clause in there, and that they that means that whatever you design for them, for the most part, it belongs to them, right? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you want to make it clear too. 
that if maybe you're just licensing that to them or whatever it is, and we can cover that in a, in a good, in a properly drafted mm -hmm. subcontract. Okay. Agreement. So this is one of the, we kind of talked about this earlier on too, that uh, when you use independent contractors, uh, you risk, you're at a higher risk of getting audited because people misclassify people all the time as independent contractors when they are in reality an employee. And even if you have subcontractor agreements and all that stuff in place, if it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, swims like a duck, it's a duck. So, and according to the IRS, they have their own guidelines and beyond the scope of this particular, mm -hmm. you know, presentation that I'd be more than happy to go over that with anybody that is currently employing or using independent contractors. If you'd like to talk to Dave and I or, Dave or me uh, about these things, I'd be more than happy to, to like, we could talk about it and make sure that, yeah. that they really are independent contractors. Hey, Chad, I got a question came in on the forum that it's kind of about where we kind of are. And it says, um, it came from Lucas, and it's a great question. It says, do the non-compete rules or standards also apply for NDAs for client relationships? Well, it's a separate type of contract, a separate agreement. Mm -hmm. Usually they're kind of put together. You have a non-compete, a non-disclosure, and a non-solicitation will be mm -hmm. in the same document, but they are three separate promises that you're making or agreements you're making with whoever okay. is that that provided for you whoever signing it okay so yeah uh, a non-disclosure is a lot easier to abide by even if you um, go from Nike golf to Adams golf like mm -hmm. you know you're just promising that I'm not going to use any information that I have gained from working at Nike as um, to benefit Adams Right. So, but yes, they, they do apply and, uh, you're going to be held by those as well. Okay. Um, but again, they can be waived, okay. uh, depending on the situation. Okay. They also have to be reasonable, right? Um, mm -hmm. uh, a, in a non-solicitation is, uh, you might bring on, you've got a, a competitor mm -hmm. that also makes golf clubs, um, or whatever that you do. And you might have so much work, but you have a good relationship with this person. Like, Hey man, I need some help and I will pay you to be a subcontractor for subcontractor for me. You're going to want them to sign that non solicitation agreement so that they're not going to go around you to try to get your client. Right. right. Unless they already are vendors of that client. Mm -hmm. Um, you don't want them to circumvent you, especially after you've introduced them yeah. to then steal your client from you. And, and that does happen. Yeah. So these subcontractor agreements are good for a lot of reasons, you know, mm -hmm. just to make sure that you're clear between one another, mm -hmm. what is expected. And then also it keeps friends, friends, right? Yeah. So if you hire an independent contractor, you're going to need to get W nine, right? W nines from them. This is where you get their tax information from them. And you, and you're going to provide that to your CPA. And uh, you want to keep those for at least four years. Um, I would suggest that this day and age, you scan all these things and you store them on the cloud somewhere instead of like keeping them in file, filing cabinets because that's going to have their social security number on that and their name and their address. You don't want your, <laughs> you don't want someone to start stealing that stuff and then getting um, open up credit cards in their name. Um, so you're going to give those W-9s to your CPA, and your CPA is going to draft up or, or create those 1099s that have to go out to your contractors by the 31st of January every year for the previous year. You're going to have to have that subcontract agreement that we've been talking about. Um, so with that, on that subcontract agreement, that's where that scope of work is going to come into play. And mm -hmm. it's going to be very crystal clear to your client or your subcontractor as to what you're asking them to do. Uh, the way I draft them is that if it's super clear and concise, it can go in the actual document, or if it's a little bit more, or if it, if, if it needs to be expanded, then you say, see exhibit A, and you apply it to the back. And that's where you outline every single thing that you are expecting from them so it's crystal clear on what they're providing for, your, for, for payment. It's also going to include all those payment details like what you talked about. I was mm -hmm. going to ask you. Um, about how you uh, handled this in the past, but you kind of did, uh, you already talked about whether, whether it be they submit the uh, payment mm -hmm. once a month, it could be every two weeks, mm -hmm. or it could be at the, you know, upon completion, or it could mm -hmm. be so much money up front and then so much money 
in different stages mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, of design or mm -hmm. whatever it is. But this is where you work out all those details so that yeah. it's not, you know, you don't know. I mean, handshakes are great. Handshake agreements are great, but you need to line these things out. Yeah, and for me, so Chad. There will be misinterpretation. Yeah, Chad, what I did on that was a lot of that was uh, predetermined by the initial contract between me and said company, right? right? So let's say I'm going with company A and they're like, hey, we're going to pay you a 10% to start. Cool. Cool. I got 10% up front. That allows me to give some money to subcontractor, just like a promissory note. Like, hey, I'm going to pay you, but we only get, we get the next 50% after all the models are approved. And we might get another 10% along there. And so knowing that, I, if I was to hire somebody, I would be like, hey, we're, we're going to get X amount here, X amount here, X amount here. And there could be three months in between there Sorry to tell you that, but I would let them know that up front so that not every first and 15th say they would come like, where's my paycheck? Right. No, no, that's not what we, but yeah, if you didn't have that, you, somebody that would happen for sure. So in addition to that, you also want to put in there that, yeah, I'm going to receive payment from the end client on mm -hmm. these dates. You will receive payment within 10 days after that. Okay. Right, because yeah. you, if they're going to pay you on the tenth, or or even it could even be like within ten days or thirty days after receipt, because we all know we have some some uh, clients that don't follow the net thirty; they're more like net sixty or ninety when they're supposed to be paying <laughs> month a month or whatever it is. It's funny how um, that works. So you want to make sure that it's clear in your contract that your subcontractor, it, well maybe, mm -hmm. will get paid. Um, after you've received payment. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you know, you're kind of on the hook for, oh, you better have the money in your account to cover those things so that, because if your agreement says you're going to pay them on, you know, 10% on this date, 30% or whatever it is, you better have the money is set aside for that. Yeah. Um, but we can work on those. Those things are negotiable too. You just have to line it all out. Mm -hmm. We've kind of talked about the IP. Uh, it's going to be clear on who owns what. Um, and then um, the non-disclosures, non-competes, and non solicitation we kind of beat that to death, I think. But if there, if we have any other questions on that, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Um, but this is also going to be included. Those non-disclosure, non-competes, non, non, non solicitation mm -hmm. will be in the subcontractor agreement, or they can be standalone documents as well. But because um, you, you might want to, if you're going to have a contractor that might work on a whole bunch of different projects you would have like a master subcontractor agreement mm -hmm. that would have these things and mm -hmm. then you have a, the uh like a uh, a subcontractor agreement that goes along with that that's that's specific to different projects but it will refer back to the master one that mm -hmm. includes all this stuff all right so invoices this is so important okay with an when you're hiring an independent contractor, you they are not going to be billing you in line item. This is how much money you owe me for my insurance. This is how much money you owe, owe me for mileage, all that kind of stuff. That's not how it works. They just give you a lump sum, and you pay that. How they line that stuff out is up to them. Now, you might want them to give you some of those line items so that, that you can see they're not overcharging you, but it should be – um, based on a, a, a set fee, you, they're going to get so much money for whatever it is, and they get paid on these times, right? Mm -hmm. It's not going to be based off of their their expenses or whatever. They need to be paying for their own travel um, for the most part. Uh, it depends. on If something changes, well, then we can come back and look at it. Mm -hmm. But they should factor in travel expenses and all that stuff should be part of their bid to you, mm -hmm. okay. right, in, in their cost. Okay. Um, but don't pay their gym membership fees. Don't pay their uh, car insurance. I've seen all these things. Do not pay for their gas bill. Don't give them a credit card mm -hmm. um, because now you're venturing into employee and not independent contractor. Ah, okay. And as a matter of fact, I just – oh, Aaron, I – sorry, I accidentally answered a, a call and I'm in the middle of a – Whoops. Our presentation in Zoom is so, – thank you. Not sure what just happened there. Um, <laughs> it's all right. Lost my whole presentation. All right. Um, there we go. And then I think I got it from here. I think that was the last slide, right? 
I for, believe, yeah. on the business side cool chad thank you so much man that was awesome and i know you're going to be hanging out for questions and stuff like that i'm going to share my screen here and let's get back over to this guy here and let's get caught up here um boom, boom, boom. let me get um escape for just a second give me one second folks yeah talk about perfect timing yeah, we got a little funniness going on here, but hey, that's the beauty of being doing something live, right? And let's do this. All right, Chad, can you see that? I sure can. All right, so I know there was a, a we had a, a pretty big audience that was going to be able to attend, and I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, those that actually attended but as we've said from the start this is we're investing in you and we want your company to be what you want it to be and so for those of you that attended today or you watched the webinar or you've submitted questions we we want to hear back from you whether you got a tip today from the business side or the solid work side or you have some tips and tricks that have come about from you doing some of these uh, live demonstrations in front of your customer or some of the tips and tricks you've had to be successful uh, with these demos or, or, or stuff like that. We want to hear from you and um, we're going to go through the list here and we're going to give away two $25 Amazon gift cards at random to uh, um, anybody in the group. So uh, please submit your feedback and your questions. Now when we ask for feedback that can be good or bad. Um, if you say, man, it was good napping music or something like that, that's, it is what it is and we'll work on it. But we also want this series to be what you want it to be. So like I said at the beginning, we're going to have uh, a tax representative, uh, a tax attorney, uh, an HR. Uh, Chad's probably going to do another one with us here coming up. Uh, web and marketing, business planning, things like that. And included in the next one will feature Dale Carnegie uh, in it. So we want to hear back from you guys as to what you want out of this series. Give us a list of topics and things that you want to see, not just from SolidWorks. SolidWorks is only part of this. We want to hear from you on the business side too. Like, hey, I could, I could really use some help with business planning or communications, whatever that is, or it's web development. Again, we want to hear from you. So let us know what we can do to tailor this for you, okay? Uh, I want to give a little plug here uh, to Alec Cook. He's doing a little webinar. It's our next one coming up, uh, The Magnus Effect. If you're on our Go Engineer emails, uh, you, I would encourage you to sign up or subscribe to that, and you will find out when the date and the time and all that is. And we have tons of webinars and things like that happening and events and um Shivani, she's joining us today. She just put out a, a pretty awesome blog on um, tanks and, and, and showing how water is moving through different tank designs and baffles. It was pretty awesome. Um, and so we as engineers here at Go Engineer, we put out three to four of these a month per person. So our goal is to keep you informed and educated, and, and uh, we want to make sure that you're up to date on your training and everything like that. So with that said, please sign up for the newsletter and your training, right? As we said at the beginning, we are going to come through this COVID. There's no doubt. And, and we want you to be prepared for success. So now's the time to get in and get some training, right? Make sure that everybody on your staff, whether it's yourself or you know staff of five, goes in. If you see some holes or some deficits in some training or they maybe, maybe they want to pick up some surfacing or something like that, check out our SolidWorks training site. We have a great list of classes. You know, right now, nobody's doing in-person classes for the obvious reasons, right? But we have online where you can do self-paced or you can do it with a group. So please go up to the goengineer.com forward slash training, register for your class, get some training, be prepared, right? Be prepared for success when this is all said and done. And then check out our YouTube channel. We have a ton of content up there and we are trying to put up more each and every day and so that you the customer maybe you want to just search for something yourself and you didn't want to contact our great folks at the help desk uh, we've got video tutorials up there on how to do just about everything 
And if you don't see something, uh, again, you're going to have my email here in just a second. You can uh, contact me and or one of any of us at Go Engineer. We'll be happy to get uh, a video up for you. And then you can follow us obviously on the on the on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And so uh, we want to stay in touch with you and we want to hear from you. And this is going to be successful uh, because of you, right? And your participation, your involvement is going to make this successful. Uh, how to contact Chad or myself? Um, there's Chad's email, chad at theharlowlawfirm.com. And there's my email, David Kersley. Uh, it's a D, D Kersley at goengineer.com. And um, Chad, uh, we've got about maybe five or 10 minutes here. We've, we've run up against the hour and it looks like we've answered all the questions. Um, and we'll hang out for maybe another couple minutes. But uh, I, I really want to thank you for your participation. I know you run a business and I know we, we uh, kind of jostled the schedule on this. And I appreciate you taking time to, to be a part of this. And I, I got to thank a couple other people at Go Engineer. Um, I want to thank Dina Love um, for helping coordinate all of this. Um, Erica Novak, she's the one that designed the awesome logo. They kind of see it on the bottom right of the screen we saw at the beginning. And that's our that's our logo. And she came up with that pretty quick. And it was pretty awesome. It was well received. And then Kayla Savali. I probably butchered your last name. And for that, I do apologize. But these three people are, are, are listening in. And they helped organize it. And they helped put everything together. And along with Shivani, Nash, Darcy, Chad, and myself, we thank everybody for attending. And it looks like we got all the questions answered. So, uh, But... Um, if anybody wants to chime in, please submit it on the Q&A, and then Chad and, and the rest of the team and I will hang out for a few more minutes. I certainly appreciate the opportunity. Hey, man, that was awesome. I learned a lot. I learned something every time. We, we You and I have kind of <laughs> done this like what, four or five times now. and Yeah, exactly. It's like, oh, man, I didn't realize that, and I didn't realize this. And so uh, part of you, part of me goes, man, how did I get by? <laughs> it's pretty scary, yeah. It is. Um, the subcon I could probably just give a whole talk just on subcontractor agreements. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was that was super informative, and you know, I, I think a lot of us think, oh, we'll we'll just start our business, and if we have to hire somebody, we can hire somebody. But there's so much more to it, you know, and you know, we just wanted to make sure everybody had some knowledge and. Again, if you have any questions and you're here in the state of Texas, uh, give Chad a shout. Yeah, thank you. I uh, had I was at a presentation for I believe it was paychecks, mm -hmm. but it could have just as easily been an AD, ADP um, representative giving it, and it was all the things that you had to do if you hired one employee, and mm -hmm. it was they would pin a piece of paper up on the wall or, mm -hmm. or taped it. For everything and then you know then there was like all these sub things that had to go with it and it went it was probably a you know like a 20 foot wall and they just had something going across the whole thing and like, wow. yep that's why we should outsource it to them for a little bit of money <laughs> <laughs> cool uh nash did you have anything you wanted to add or shivani or darcy they may not be there at the moment no, that's great stuff, guys. Cool. Looks like we got something in the Q&A here. Let me click on it. Then this is if I, uh... Okay, Chad, we got a question that's popped up in here. Chad, uh, um, the question came in from Matt Weiss. Sorry if I messed up your name, but it looks like it says, if I missed this, my apologies, but does Chad Harlow handle patents? I do not, but I have a fantastic um, uh, firm that I always send to uh, uh, person that I send most people to is Sanjeev Kumar and he's in the, in the Austin area. Okay. And then, um, uh, could you, could you, uh, email that to me, his information, Chad, That's or, or my, Matt, Absolutely. you've got Chad's email and my email there up on the screen. Email us. Uh, and then, um, we can get that information over to you, either Ch Chad or myself. Thanks. That's a great question. And so yes. that will be one of our upcoming, um, webinar or growth summits, it will be on patents and, you know, like a lot of people want a patent, but the question is how much are you willing to spend on that patent? 
And how much are you willing to spend to defend that patent, right? So that always becomes kind of tricky, right? It's, it's nice to have a patent, but you can go bankrupt trying to get a patent. <laughs> who, who do you have that's going to speak to that? I'm still working on that, so uh, okay. we may use your contact on that. Uh, I'm waiting to hear back on the person that I've always used for patents. And, um, who is that? Her name is Jen, and I'll send you all her contact information. She's real good, and um, yep. um, we can go from there, but she's real good on it. But, you know, it just gets crazy expensive. A lot of people think patents are, I'm just going to spend 500 bucks and get a patent, and then no one will ever take my idea. Mm, and there's different types of patents, right? There's a, you know, process, process manufacturing. Yeah, I mean, again, how, how are you going to defend that patent? So uh, that's a good so question. I, I, have the, uh, I have a chemistry degree background, and I could sit for that bar and become a patent attorney, but I don't have the patience for that. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, that looks like we've got all of our questions answered. Again, thank you, everybody. We look forward to hearing your uh, feedback. Again, thanks, everybody, for attending.